Good afternoon, Beach Acres Parenting Center followers. I am here for our next um, Facebook Live and so excited today that we're going to be talking with an expert about cyber world, screen time, um, technology interfaces, and how to parent through all that. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Stephen Smith, our guest, introduce himself and um, then we'll get started. Great. Well, thanks first off for inviting me to uh, be on Facebook Live. This is my first time really actually uh, doing something like this, uh, at least from a uh, business perspective and that, so I, I appreciate it. Um, so my background, uh, many, many years ago, before most of you were born, uh, I was a high school teacher and a high school coach. I did that for a few years. Um, had a real interest in uh, video and film production and went out and did that for about 20 years. And back in the 80s and 90s, when you're doing film and video production, you were basically using computers before most people were. So I learned a lot about technology, uh, did a lot of uh, work with technology-oriented companies, and eventually for uh, left that business and got into the information technology business for another 20 years. And as I always say, um, uh, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today is that, um, a Technology has never grown as quickly as it has grown over the last 10 to 15 years. And as a result, um, we're a little over our skis, I think, as society, being able to kind of digest all of this and understand how it impacts us as individuals, but more importantly, how it impacts children. And about eight, nine years ago, I began to see all of these things kind of unraveling and thought, you know, this is given my background and given my passion for helping families, uh, particularly uh, kids, uh, that this would be uh, something I ought to be doing with the rest of my life. So um, that's why I'm here today. And I appreciate you allowing me and a Wired family to uh, talk to you, to you and to talk to all your constituents. Awesome. And can I say I'm a super, super fan. fan. Um, I've seen you speak a few times. We partnered on some things and you've been to my kids' schools, my friends' kids' schools. So thank you for all you're doing. I'm glad you have the passion. <laughs> Many Absolutely. parents, I'm sure, are. So thank we're you. gonna go ahead and jump right in, Stephen. We have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, as a parenting center, many parents come to us with questions on a daily basis. So I'd love to get through as many of those as we can. Sure. And to our viewers, you can submit questions anytime during our live session. So feel free to do so. Um, if those come in while we're chatting with Stephen live, we will go ahead and ask those questions because I'm sure there will be some good ones. Um, so feel free to go ahead and do that, viewers, if you want. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk about screen time. We've been talking a lot about this at Beach Acres over the last few weeks. If you've seen our posts um, or if you just talk with us, that's been a big topic. So how do parents start discussions with their kids about screen time? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, and there's been an, there have been a few studies out there um, really probably over the last 18 to 24 months about screen time. And there will continue to be more and more studies on this. The reality is, I think, is with, um, and just thinking in terms of addictions, there are certain personalities that are more prone to um, be consumed by certain things, be consumed by alcohol, drugs, sex, and sometimes social media and video games. But the reality is, take addiction and put it to the side, is that we're parents and we are raising children and these children's minds are just being developed, right? They're very pliable at, at, at this point, sometimes up to maybe even the, the mid-20s. And our brains, biologically, were never meant to be bombarded with all of this endless stimulus. So some studies suggest, and this is something that I've kind of uh, come to believe, that um, if your child is spending more than two hours per day on video games or on social media, we may be getting to the point, getting to, to the edge of, of limits. Um, and the, in a recent video I just did, I kind of compared it to, we know as moms and dads that if your child asks you if they could eat ice cream for breakfast and then could they have ice cream at lunch, could they have ice cream for dinner and before they went to bed, could they have an ice cream snack, that over time, that's going to play havoc with them biologically, right? 
And I think we also have to understand the exact same thing is true with this type of technology. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong with social media. It's, it's how it's used and the length of time that it's being used and also where it's being used. So I think we got to start with the conversation that I love you. I'm your mom. I'm your, I'm your dad. I'm only interested in, in the best things for you. And as a mom or as a dad, I'm telling you, we are going to create some restrictions in the amount of time that you are allowed to use these devices. And just as importantly, we want you to be a whole person. We don't want you to be a singular one dimensional person who's consumed with just one aspect of life, video games, social media, and what have you. And, and then uh, I guess third or fourth, I would say that there are some research that does suggest that there could be a relationship between the amount of time you're on social media um, and childhood depression and anxiety. I don't think, well, I don't think all the facts are in yet, but one thing that is in is that since 2007, this has continued to go up, 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 and up. And I've spoken to about 400,000 kids. My personal belief, there is a relationship. And it does not mean that every child that's doing social media for four or five hours a day is, is going to have some type of mental health issue. But I think there's the correlation between the two. And as parents, we need to be able to talk to our kids and explain those things to them. I love the fact that you just want to be very upfront, set expectations, and be very clear about why with kids. Um, that's just so, so good. So good for kids to hear directly from parents. So we did get a question. Um, Courtney is asking a question about younger kids. So um, I know a lot of your tour in our region has been around um, middle schools, high schools, and maybe some elementaries. But this is about babies and toddlers. Um, many of us have been out in the world and seen babies and toddlers with phones and tablets in their hands. Um, is there anything um, around that that can contribute to potential, you know, things you were just talking about, like the um, maybe inattention or the um, need to always have a screen or any of the future things? Because brain development is happening so clearly during those ages. So what do you think about these little people engaging with not social media, but maybe videos and, and technology? Right. I have, I've read a few things on that. Um, I, I personally do not have any experience with that in anything that I've done, but, you know, the, the readings that I have done suggest, and, and we know just, you know, back in the 80s when my kids were, were being raised, just having um, uh, things in her crib that, that might sparkle or move uh, gets, the, get a gets a child's attention, right? Today, you're talking about something else where the screen is constantly moving, constantly changing, and then this child is constantly looking for feedback, 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 from that singular glowing device. And I think just logically speaking, that's not a good idea. And I, and I know there have been some, some doctors have suggested the exact same thing. Now that doesn't, does it mean that you can't sit there with your child uh, with your iPad and, you know, and, and work with stories and little cartoons, educational cartoons and things. Obviously you can do those, things. but to put that device in a child's hand giving them almost unfettered access to things for 30, 40, 50 minutes at a time, logic would suggest that's probably not a good idea, but I think the jury's still out on that. Great. That's great feedback. And just like you said before, everything in moderation right. and definitely just monitoring what they're doing and how often and how long. All right. So our next question, and this is one that we have heard over the last several months. I can't tell you how many times this game that has taken over the world called Fortnite Many of us, myself included, are trying to figure out, you know, when we look at look at that game, what is it? What should we know about it? Um, yep. What are some watch outs other than quantity? We know you've, you've mentioned that. But what else? What is this thing called Fortnite? Well, Fortnite is what would be would be categorized as being a single shooter game. So the perspective is from that of the individual that's in the game. Right. The, the player or a player in the game. Um and how it differs from some of the other video games that are out there is that it's not quite as graphic or gory as, as some of the things like a Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto. Um, and, but yet at the same time, you're still an individual and you're, you're killing and, or, and, 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 and hoping not, not to be killed. Um, you know, it takes place in this uh, 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 
unreal world where I think 98% of the world's population has been destroyed and, and you're, you're left there to fend for yourself against zombies or zombie like creatures and that. And of course they make money off of selling skin. So it's a, it's a free game. So it's very attractive in that respect. Um, it went mobile. Gosh, I, I want to say maybe six months ago, nine months ago, I forget. And when it went mobile, it just exploded. So kids could be playing it in a cafeteria. They could be playing it on a bus and so on and so forth. And I think that's one of the the, the reasons it's, it's had this incredible mercurial rise to popularity. Uh, and and so and also it, you know, sometimes these games are very gender specific. Uh, like Call of Duty, you might find a lot more young men playing Call of Duty, but we're finding more and more young women now playing playing Fortnite. And it's become an issue with schools, not because schools think it's a horrible devil worshiping game or anything like that. It, it's because it's actually taking time away from class. Kids are sometimes being somewhat disruptive and what have you on that. Um, is it a, is it a bad game? I think compared to some of the other things that are out there, absolutely not. It's, it's not a bad game. And it, it really goes back to the amount of time that the kids are playing it. I, I, I this is one of the things that, I, that I'm really passionate about is that we do not spend enough time talking to our kids. And, and I have to be careful what I say. I'm very hard on parents sometimes because I think, I think technology has, has made it easy to give a device to a child, uh, yeah, give, them, uh, give them a device, have them go down in the, into the, the basement and play a video game or do social media, and you don't have to talk to your kid. You don't have to manage them. You don't have to monitor them. Um, this is a real opportunity when you're talking about a game like Fortnite for parents, maybe even play with the child. And when they're playing with the child, talk to them. Um, the biggest issue with social media, from my perspective, is that parents use these devices as babysitters. Um, and I'm not afraid to tell that to a lot of parents. And as a result, those meaningful conversations that, you know, we as, as moms and dads have had with children in the past don't take place as much. Now that's a very blanket statement. So I know not everybody's like that, obviously in that, but you know, I talk to a lot of kids and I would say 60% of kids, because I ask this question all the time, are your parents distracted? Do they, do they talk to you? Do they communicate with you? The overwhelming majority of them will say no. And what a sad statement in a country as great as ours to have parents that are, um, not involved as much in their kids' life. They're together, right? They're, they're together. They're in the same car. They might be in the same living room with one another, but they're not communicating with one another. And, you know, video games, social media, I think I'll play a role in that. And you're speaking our language, Stephen, because as a parenting center, this is exactly the kind of thing that we talk with parents about. You know, relationship is everything with kids. And as they grow and they develop, if you haven't set that foundation and if you haven't reinforced it, it becomes very challenging to really mold and shape that little person into the person they're meant to be. Right. Um, so we at Beach Acres completely agree. I think we, we we speak from the same songbook when it comes to those things. So I appreciate you being up front with us. I think as parents, um, many of us appreciate the authenticity you bring to these type of conversations because um, there really are some good things we should be taking from from your learnings and from your your sharing. So um, moving right along because we have lots of questions. Um, this YouTube Kids um, channel has um, come into play, I suppose. And um, do you believe that if we let our kids get on YouTube Kids, that it's safe, filtering is clear, that we are good to let them watch? Or should we really be monitoring YouTube Kids just as we would any other video site? Well, I think you have to monitor it. Um, you know, the... the, the most of these things, most technologies like this, social media technologies, um, have an algorithm that monitors things, and then they have a few humans. Um, the, the problem with uh, YouTube kids is that they didn't have enough humans, and uh, that was number one. And number two, the content just wasn't any good, and I still don't think it's the greatest in the world, right? Um what they've done to come combat that is they've hired more people to actually be actively involved in looking at looking at the content. Um, and so from that perspective, it's, it's probably better, 
but it's still, there, there's always going to be the possibility. I actually ran a, a small social media site and we had some algorithms and um, that, that we would run that, that would actually filter certain content out. And the reality is, is the best filters are, are going to fail sometimes and it'll be just your luck. It's going to fail um, with, with your child. But that would be less my concern. My greatest concern is that the content on there is, isn't the greatest in the world. So, you know, is, is your child going to be scorned for life or scarred for life, excuse me, if they go on there? No, probably not. But uh, it's just not that great of a site for your child to, to be looking at. And, you know, what I would really do is uh, I would go to commonsensemedia.org. Commonsensemedia.org is a great, um, it's all, it's an app and it's also a website. There's a lot of parenting information as it comes to media. Um, you know, mine focuses more on, you know, um, certainly, certainly parenting, but I'm not going, I'm not getting down into the weeds in terms of, of content, ch- you know, childproof content that's out there. Common Sense Media will, and they also rate rate the uh, content that's out there as well. Yeah, and we um, have taken your recommendation for that site, um, and I've used it with some parents. I know many of us here at Beach Acres have used it, um, yeah. and we'll make sure to include that, and we're going to have some resources included in our post of this podcast, so, and on our website. So, just so you know, we parents and listeners, we will make sure to give you all the resources. All right, great information about YouTube Kids. Um, So let's talk about parental controls, um, which is kind of what we talked about with YouTube Kids. But when we get into this, um, how do we implement controls at home without being like police officers and having to just, I I don't know, what, what it would even take? It seems sometimes like it's very difficult. What are some ways we can institute some controls that work for parents, that work for kids, and that are easy to put in place? Sure. The, the I think the best control and the easiest control is, as you mentioned it before, establishing a relationship with your child and talking with them, talking with them, talking with them, and talking with them. And I say talking with them, don't talk at them, right? Have a conversation about you know, what you're going to allow your child to do. As a family, we're going to agree to do certain things, maybe even sign a contract. A lot of really good contracts out there um, that are for families related to technology, and one of them happens to be on commonsensemedia.org. So that's number one. Number two is, and this is one of the most irritating things to me as as somebody that has been in this for nine years, you got to have tech-free zones in your home. It is bad parenting. All you parents that are out there, you're not doing it. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It's bad parenting if you allow your child, and I'm not talking about 17, 18-year-old kids. I'm talking about 12, 13, 14-year-old kids. If you allow them to take their phones into their bedroom, keep it there overnight, that is, that's bad parenting. Um, we are now two decades into the 21st century. We have to start thinking like we are in the 21st century. To me, um, as an old guy, right, but has been in technology as long as I have, I don't look at the concrete world and the digital world much differently. Um, I always tell you know parents, the greatest city I've ever been in is New York City, but I'd never let my 12, 13-year-old child roam New York City by themselves. I'd have to kind of manage and monitor what they're doing. And hopefully I'm there as a docent to help them appreciate what New York City is all about. But when you give your child unfettered access to that device, this is what I guarantee you will happen to 90% of the kids. They will use that device at midnight. They'll use that device at one, two, three o'clock in the morning. How do I know that? Because that is exactly what almost every child that I speak with at a school will tell me, right? Now, does it mean they're doing horrible things um, at one, two, three o'clock in the morning? No. But, you know, if you've got a 13 or 14 year old child, or we'll say even 15 years old, understand that the majority of sexting takes place under your roof, in your child's bedroom, or, or possibly a bathroom. And it's usually after 10 o'clock at night, but probably closer to 12, one o'clock in the morning than that. So that's that's something you, you, you've got to be able to do. And that doesn't cost you any money. You just say you're not using the phone in your bedroom at this at this time. Third thing is there um, you got to control the Google Play and the iTunes Store password, and and there's really easy ways to do it. For, for with an iPhone, 
you just go to your you know privacy um, and then you go to restrictions. And then with the restrictions, you can you can keep your child from downloading any apps. You're the only one that can download those apps. But why is that important? Um, it's really important because there are uh, ghost and vault apps that are out there, and they've been actually out there for a while. So hopefully most parents know about them. But it allows a child to hide their apps, allows them to hide their photographs, their videos, and what have you on that. And you might say, well, is that really a big deal for, for kids? It is. It can It can be. In 20 to 30% of the cases, particularly by the time a child's in high school, um, they're sending inappropriate photographs. And that is not for me to say that's moral or immoral. It is to say that there are consequences if that photograph finds itself in the ethers of the internet, right? Does that happen? I'll tell you, because certainly what I do, Every year, I'm called into a situation where a good kid has made a bad decision, and now it's costing them, either from a legal perspective, but more than legal, it has to do with their ability to get into a college, to maintain a scholarship, and particularly from an athletic perspective, to be able to get that athletic scholarship once that photograph or their words are discovered, right? I always tell tell kids, why would we give the power of a photograph or the power of a word and put it in the hands of another individual who can use that against you at some point in your life, maybe just at the point that you're going to become a productive member of society. And then the last thing, and excuse me, I hear my dog barking in the background. Hopefully you can't. Um, There are parental controls out there. So the free parental control would be the one that comes with your router. But I got to tell you that, router is usually not very user friendly. If you're not technically savvy, sometimes that router and the parental controls that are built into the router are are a little cumbersome to use. Um, Two or three years ago, if we were having this conversation, I would say there aren't a lot of good parental controls. I will tell you right now, there are a multitude of them. There's custodian with a Q, which will, will give you more information than you probably want about what your child is doing. There are Circle with Disney, which used to be one of my favorite. I still like it. Um, Circle with Disney uh, allows you to very easily say what devices can be used um, at what time, right? And what apps can be used by what child. Um, the problem that I've heard from parents is that sometimes it can overload the, your Wi-Fi network at your house. I personally haven't experienced that, uh, but my kids are grown. I've used it in my house with my grandkids, but they're not here all the time. So, um, I, but I've not experienced a slowdown. Uh, you know, kids is another one. You with the letter U, um, uh, bark, and actually, I've, I've heard some really good reviews from parents with bark. So, there's really no excuse not to be able to manage and monitor what your child's doing. And I want to be clear: I'm not saying you should be managing your 17 and 18 year old as closely as you're going to your 12 or 13 year old. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but age sometimes has nothing to do with maturity and trust has more to do with it than, than age. Right. Those are great tips. And I think we all could leave, even with yeah. one of those yeah. tips, yeah. Institute, yeah. It, yeah. it would make a big difference in our kids. You know, the way that they interact online or just their knowledge of, or your ability to lean in when you need to, and their knowledge of the fact that you're doing it. <laughs> you're watching mm-hmm. what they're up to. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, although we have a lot more, I'd like to get to one more. Um, what exactly, you know, when we talk about um, some of these apps, they will um, potentially turn devices off at a certain time. They will turn off your Wi-Fi at a certain time. Um, those kinds of things. Do you recommend we go that far, or do you, as parents, or do you think that Um, we should just stay engaged, pay attention, um, monitor what they're up to. Um, Because I know some parents have really benefited from that. The the phone goes off at 10 o'clock at night and does not come on till four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, wherever time the kid gets up. What are your thoughts on that? Because we wonder, should we lean in that much or should we let the kids have some ability to make some decisions and choices during those times? Well, I think it's like with everything, right? In the concrete world, in the digital world, um, you always have to um, give your child some leeway as they prove themselves to you, right? Um, But let me give you an example. One thing I've really heard over the last, well, I'll I'll say it was probably in April or May, and I'm not sure why this happened. 
had more and more parents come to me at the end of my presentation and say, I wish I had used tech-free zones in my home. My son or my daughter, a lot of times it's son, would not be going through what they're going through right now. And for some reason in those two months, what they were going through right now, they had become so addicted to pornography. Um, and I, I think that's one of the, and again, that's not a morality statement. If you're 21, God bless you, go out and do whatever you want to do, right? But when you're 12 and 13 and 14 years old and you have access to pornography, when I was 12, 13 or 14 years old, if I had access to pornography, I would have accessed it. Why? Because I was normal. I was curious, right? And that's why we have to put ourselves in the position of a child at that age. And if you're if you're not managing and monitoring a 12, 13, 14 year old child, shame on you, right? Put yourself back in that position. Doesn't mean your child your child's bad if they're trying to access pornography or or they've stumbled upon a virtual reality porn site, which is the one of the, the bigger issues we have right now in 2018 and coming in 2019. Um, but yeah, taking a step back, yes, you should give your child some leeway. Know your child. If you're talking to your child and you have a relationship with that child, you'll begin to feel what, what you can trust them with and what you can't trust them with. But again, going back to, to April and May, why did I have so many parents come up to tell me about their 17, 18, 19 year old children that are addicted to pornography? Um, would they be addic addicted to those to a pornography if they had had some restrictions and their parents kind of knew what they were doing? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, but you know, we started off this this discussion talking about talking, and if you're talking, that's the best thing you can you can possibly do right that's it's not a guarantee none of these things are guaranteed everything can be circumvented but at least if you're talking you 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 know how much trust that you're that you can have in that in that young man or that young woman yep and i think you're absolutely right i think that um, the foundation is relationship and as parents, you know, the tech world, some of us are savvy, some of us are not. And understanding some things we can do to prevent some terrible things from happening with our kids, but to right. inform ourselves. There's a lot out there. And um, starting with you is a great place. And I know you have some resources um, to share. And we're going to put those with the post, too. But can you share your resources with the listeners and the viewers so that we can you know, make sure they know where to go. They can even click the minute they get off this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for allowing me to do that. So my website is a wired family.org. Um, that's, I have, I try to do at least one video a month. My most recent video I did is about uh, distracted parenting um, called mom, dad, put the phone down. Uh, and I, I literally have probably at least 40 videos up there over a hundred articles um, I tweet every day, so I'll find an article from someplace around the world that's related to parenting in a digital age. And you, so my Twitter handle is at a wired family. My Facebook page is facebook.com slash a wired family. And I published a book that came out in uh, September, and it's called Social Media, Your Child's Digital Tattoo. It's available on amazon.com as both a print publication and also an ebook. All right. So I invite everyone who's listening or watching this Facebook live session to check out A Wired Family. Check out Stephen's book. Stephen, thank you so much thank for you. being part of our, our Facebook live session today. Um, for those of you who'd like to learn more, feel free to reach out to Beach Acres Parenting Center at beachacres.org or feel free to give us a call 513-231-6630. Until next time, have a wonderful afternoon. And thanks again, Stephen. Thank you. Take care. Take Good care. Luck.